So we've gone back to cataclysm, but this is a little bit different. Over the last period, a few months now, of course, we've been thinking of cataclysm in the land of Israel. And, um, but I felt particularly now, I just want to focus in the next two talks, as it happens, um, maybe three talks, on the Temple Mount, because this is where we're heading for, I think, in these talks, I think. And although I thought I might have been able to do a little bit more um, in this one talk, uh, I knew by the time I'd got halfway through it that I'm, I got far too much material. So this has to be part one, and we'll have to wait for part two until the next time. But I showed this picture uh, at the end of our last talk, which, uh, as you can see, is, uh, take from the Atlas of Israel in 1985, this particular picture, and you see the earthquake fault line that runs relatively close to the temple, which has been identified as such. Obviously, it's coming up from the Dead Sea, um, where we've talked a lot about the, uh, the Dead Sea Transform Fault in particular. And we've considered three earthquakes in particular that have affected the temple, where this earthquake fault is obviously very significant. We talked about the Amos earthquake. It's called the Amos earthquake because of the fact that it is recorded in the book of Amos in particular, but it happened in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then we went on to think of the earthquake that took place in 31 BC in the days of Herod the Great. And then in our last talk we thought of the particularly thought of the earthquake that took place at the crucifixion and the aftershock that took place at the resurrection, both of which are recorded in the gospel accounts. But this was a picture that we showed uh, several times now, which is a beautiful uh, uh, painting or drawing by this guy John Claude Golvin, which is a picture of Herod's Jerusalem. And Herod, of course, was a great builder, and he had an opportunity to rebuild the city after the earthquake that took place in 31 BC. And we know that one of the things that he built in Jerusalem was this hippodrome or sports arena, which was very similar to the one perhaps in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes in the second century BC. Um, there's a problem though, as we discussed last time, there's a problem because there is no archaeological evidence of this hippodrome. So the question is, how do we know about it? Any ideas? Sure. Yes, <laughs> Josephus. <laughs> Josephus writes about it. He was an eyewitness. But the problem is we don't have any archaeological evidence for it and it will become clear as we go through this talk why that is so. But we thought and focused our th thoughts on the temple, Herod's temple, that was um, built after Zerubbabel's temple, which is the second temple, was uh, demolished by Herod. We talked about that a lot over the last two times. But we need to think a little bit more about it. Some of the things we've mentioned, some of the things we haven't talked about. We know, or we can work out, maybe more particularly, that its construction began around 20 BC. And if you remember, there was this very interesting anchor point, time anchor point, that was given in John's Gospel when uh, the Jewish leadership are um, taken aback by the claims of Jesus that he would be raised from the dead in three days, and they say it's taken 46 years to build this temple. 
So that gives us uh, an opportunity to fairly accurately date. We can't be absolutely exact, but we can fairly accurately date the building of the temple. And if you remember in that talk, <laughs> I'm not going to show it again, uh, we did a timeline uh, which was for me absolute revelation. And if anybody hasn't seen that talk, I can send you the link. It's called Israel 3. This talk is called Israel 4. And uh, everything fits together in that timeline. It was just amazing. And we use this final verse in John's Gospel as the actual clincher of the timeline. I loved it. The fact is this. When we come to consider Herod's temple... That there, there, there is no obvious archaeological evidence of its exact location on the Temple Mount. And of course Jesus said these words in Matthew's Gospel. We'll refer to this chapter a few times. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And of course it happened. The question is exactly when did it happen? We'll come on to that later. The fact is, when we come to consider the exact location of the temple on the Temple Mount, it is not possible to discover it. It could be discovered, but uh, any disruption of the Temple Mount drives the Islamic world absolutely mad. So there's not, no possibility of discovering its exact location yet. And because of that, not, um, not surprising that there are many theories as to the exact location of the temple on the Temple Mount. But that's not the only problem, folks. <laughs> And this is where it gets really interesting, in my opinion. Let's consider this beautiful diagram drawing of Jean-Claude Golvin and focus on the Temple Mount. There's something that we have to say. It's just too large. What, what do you mean, Jeff? The Temple Mount is just too large. How do we know? that it's just too large. Can you tell me the answer? <laughs> Joseph. Fall off the edge, Jeff. <laughs> Josephus. Uh, but not just Josephus, folks. Not just Josephus. Also the Mishnah. This was the beginnings of the Talmud. There's this tractate, Midot, which talks about the temple. Now, interestingly, let's continue, continue to think about the Temple Mount. The fact is, Joseph, Josephus and the Mishnah say that the Temple Mount was square. They give dimensions. They're complicated because they're using ancient terms. But in effect, Josephus says that the Temple Mount was 190 by 190 metres. The Mishnah gives a slightly larger dimension, 250 by 250 metres, but in both cases, the Temple Mount was square. Today's Temple Mount has these dimensions, 300 by 500 metres. Now, I like this diagram, and I got it from... Um, uh, this particular website that you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, templemount.org, which shows the relative dimensions of the Temple Mounts, according to Josephus, according to the Mishnah, and the Temple Mount today, which you can see in purple. Actually, if we put those purple lines over an aerial view of the Temple Mount, it looks like this. And I'll just highlight the fact, as you obviously know, this is what is known as the Dome of the Rock. It's not a mosque, it's a shrine. But the mosque is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and you can see it located here. One's got a golden dome and one's got a silver dome. 
There are, as I say, many theories as to the exact location of the temple on the Temple Mount. And this is really the traditional or accepted hypothesis that the Temple Mount, which you see here in sort of pinkish red colour, is overlaying the Dome of the Rock. That slightly adjusted its position to give a correct orientation, which is then the, uh, what is called the middle hypothesis. Actually, in the early 80s, when I was in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, I heard uh, Asher Kaufman speak and uh, was rather taken with his ideas at the time. And here you see the location of the temple, which is to the north of the Dome of the Rock. Actually, the Holy of Holies, according to Asher Kaufman, is over what is known as the Temple of Tablets or the Temple of Spirits. And you can go to this place on if you if you want to go up onto the Temple Mount, you can go and see this place for yourself. There. You've been there. You've done it. You've yeah. got the T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I want to introduce to you a person who has become my hero in all of this. And this isn't just now. You know, if you've uh, read the book that I sent round, I, I wrote about Tuvia Sagiv uh, in, 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 uh, in that book. And he has uh, the Southern Hypothesis. And here, just to highlight again, in the purple colours, uh, where the Dome of the Rock is, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is, and here is the Western Wall, which of course is actually in close proximity to the position of the temple, which is an interesting thought, and Tuvia Sagiv makes quite a lot out of it. I want to highlight somewhere else. Uh, the Alcas Fountain, Tuvia, and I think I'm inclined to agree with him, as you will get the impression, that this fountain which is on the Temple Mount marks the site of the Holy of Holies and here is uh, a picture of it you can see the um, Dome of the Rock in the distance behind us looking at this photograph would be the Al-Aqsa Mosque so it's sort of halfway between the two and this is something that occurred to me for the first time as I was preparing this, uh, this talk I just want to look at the name of the fountain, the al Kas fountain. That, there's a Hebrew equivalent word to Kas, which is Kos. The word Kos in Hebrew is cup. And of course, as you look at the al Kas fountain, you see at the center of it something that looks like a cup. I didn't, this had never occurred to me before. This is the verse in Zechariah chapter 12. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. I think this is a physical manifestation of the issue with respect to the Temple Mount in the Islamic world which are the people surrounding this nation. It's a fantastic chapter. <laughs> OK, now, I recommend this guy. This is Tuvia Sagiv, and I took a, a screenshot so that you could do this for yourself. If you look at these words and search for them in YouTube, you will come up with a series of three lectures. They're all in Hebrew, but as you can see here, there are English subtitles. The person who is saying, hi everyone, is not Tuvia Sergeev. He, She is the interviewer. She's very sceptical. She's very sceptical of his theories to begin with. She's orthodox Jewish woman. By the time she has gone through the evidence, she can hardly look 
at the evidence with their own eyes. So it's an amazing series of three talks. I really recommend them. What Tuvia Sagiv does in one part of his series of talks is to look at infrared photography of the Temple Mount. Now, the white areas are likely to be foundations of the temple because they will emit more heat. But you can't see them with your own eyes because they're underground. In fact, Tuvia reckons that the temple was actually situated much lower than has been thought. But here you see the foundations and, and also you see the arrow pointing to the Alcas fountain, which may be looking into the Holy of Holies. The woman who is convinced by his arguments by the end of his talks can hardly bring herself to look. It's an amazing series of talks. I really recommend them. So if we think of the relative dimensions, which we've already looked at, I want to look at the Temple Mount. Now, this is another um, diagram taken from the templemount.org, and here you see the Dome of the Rock, here you see the al -Aqsa Mosque, and here you see the positioning of the temple, and the little words there that you can just about make out the al Kas Fountain. Just to um, colour in the areas, this is the today's Temple Mount. And if I put in Josephus Temple Mount, the interesting thing Josephus tells us also, not just about the Temple Mount, but the Antonia Fortress. He writes about it in his uh, writings on the antiquities of the Jews. Antuvia is convinced that the Antonia Fortress, which obviously no longer exists, was actually built on the rock, which is the Dome of the Rock. It's the foundation stone of the Antonia Fortress. And also, of course, the orientation of that temple has to be towards the east. It's facing east, that's for certain. It's facing the Mount of Olives. We talked about that in our last talk. So where did it all come from, folks? Today's Temple Mount. And who is this person that I flash up? He's the Emperor Hadrian, whose reign was from 117 to 138. He's AD. good at building walls. You're right. We'll come on to that in a moment. But we need to know more about the Emperor Hadrian. Okay. This was his, or one of his names, actually, because wherever you look, you see something slightly different. Publius Aelius Hadrianus. The word I've highlighted there, Aelius, is a family name, and of course, eventually, he's going to apply his name to the rebuilt Jerusalem, Aelia Capitolina, and we'll come to that in a moment. He was born in 76 AD. As we've already seen in the last picture, he was emperor from 117 to 138 AD. And this is something that I bring out in the book. I wouldn't get hung up on it. <laughs> but he's the 10th emperor after Nero. Why is it significant? I think it might have something to do with this. But I'm not... Um, I'm not um, not going to be so um, committed to it, but I think it's significant. In the book of Revelation, actually, it's chapter 17 here. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. Now, with all our discussion of the beast and its mark, we need to recognise that in the days of the New Testament, particularly in the Gospel area, uh, era, the beast was the Emperor Nero. And the 666 has all to do with his name. And that's not to say it may not have future application and fulfilment. But if we miss what the early disciples came to understand in the book of Revelation, 
we recognize that 666, or in some versions 616, but it's too complicated to talk about now, actually is a coded version of the Emperor Nero. But there are ten horns, uh, ten kings, and the tenth king is Hadrian. If we think Her Herod was a great builder, he's nothing, nothing compared with the emperor Hadrian. And he built temples to Jupiter and to other pagan gods. Wherever he went, he also built a wall <laughs> in the north of England to, to, keep, the, uh, to keep the Scots at bay. Um, he was a great builder. And an example of uh, the temples that he built actually are in a place called Baalbek in modern-day Lebanon. And here is a reconstruction of the Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek. You can see in the bottom right, you can actually see a little ma map which uh, shows you where Baalbek is. It's got an interesting name. I suppose it's in the Bekar Valley in Lebanon. Baalbek in Lebanon. This is what that temple of Jupiter and other temples might have been like. And here is um, an overview of that structure, which is very complex. And I just want to point out um, polygon shapes, the temple of Jupiter, temple of Bacchus, so there's another temple associated with Jupiter, and here's a temple of Venus down here. Now this is interesting. This is not Jerusalem. This is Baalbek in Lebanon. And I particularly want to point out this. When you go around Jerusalem, particularly if you go to the Western Wall Tunnels, it talks about Herodian stones. They're not Herodian stones. They're the stones of Hadrian, not Herod. This is amazing to me. And here are some of the largest blocks that have ever been used. Now, Hadrian used these blocks to expand whatever Temple Mount might have been in Baalbek. That's what he had to do because he had momentous plans to build very elaborate temples and he needed to expand the platform. And he sees he uses these very large blocks in order to do it. Stands so right next door to them, Jeff. Have you really, Jeremy? Amazing. I've never. I have actually been. I have actually been in Lebanon for a very brief period. Uh, it was a very interesting they, experience. They are enormous. They're huge. Have you been, have you seen this block, Jeremy? Um, this is actually in Baalbek, but I mean this this was quarried, but it was never used. This is the largest megalith, or whatever you want to call it, um, that's ever been excavated and discovered, although it was never used in the construction of the Temple Mount platform of the Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek. Now, if you go to the Western Wall Tunnels, and I can really recommend it, you see similar very large blocks and I believe it is absolutely conclusive that the Temple Mount was greatly expanded by Hadrian. And here is I suppose effectively the Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek overlaid over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and you see here the Dome of the Rock, and here you see the um, El Aqsa Mosque, and I suppose this is where the Al Qas Fountain is. How do we know that he built a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount? We know it from the writings of Cassius Dio. We, remember, we haven't got Josephus in the second century. We can't refer to Josephus here because he died before the second century, I think. And this is what Cassius Dio writes. 
At Jerusalem, Hadrian founded a city in place of the one which had been razed to the ground, naming it, that's the new city, Elia Capitolina. Remember, Elia is taken from Hadrian's own name. Capitolina, Jupiter and Capitolina are linked together. And on the site of the temple of the Jewish God, the word Jewish is actually not in his text, he raised a new mm. temple to Jupiter. But he didn't just raise a temple dedicated to Jupiter. Now this is not Hadrian. This is a very ancient sculpture with a Caesar on horseback and this is Marcus Aurelius. But here is a coin of Hadrian and you see on the reverse side of the coin Hadrian on horseback and this was a, an uh, a motif that was used particularly uh, in those places where the Romans had conquered and occupied. The Caesar would be seen riding on enormous statues in horseback. Now, do we know anything about this? Amazingly, we do. Because in the 4th century, in the year 333 AD, um, there was a pilgrim who visited Jerusalem, known as the Bordeaux Pilgrim. We don't know if it was a man or a woman. It was probably a man when you think about it. And he wrote this in his uh, travel diary or notes. There are two statues of Hadrian. And not far from the statues, there is a perforated stone to which the Jews come every year and anoint it, bewail themselves with groans, rend their garments, and so depart. What are they grieving for? They're grieving for the temple. But this is an amazing uh, thing that is in the commentary written by Jerome in the year 398 AD. This is what Jerome writes. He's commenting on the verse in Matthew chapter 24. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, I like this bit, or to the statue of the mounted Hadrian, which stands to this very day on the site of the Holy of Holies. This is um, very, very interesting. The temple no longer exists, and presumably if al Cas Fountain is where the Holy of Holies is today, or marks the site of the Holy of Holies, in the days of the 4th century there was a statue of the Mounted Hadrian. Of course, when we think about uh, these words that are commented on by Jerome, we refer, of course, to Matthew chapter 24 itself, which is Jesus speaking to his disciples with the temple in the background, and Jesus is answering questions. And he says this in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Mark, or words very close to it in the Gospel of Mark. So when you see standing in the holy place... In the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, that's in itself incredibly significant, in my opinion. I think I highlight it. Yes, I do. <laughs> it means there's something to read here, folks. It's actually in writing now. So what are we talking about? Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you see the abomination standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee, flee to the mountains. Luke's account is different. There's no doubt about it. He doesn't mention the abomination of desolation in his version of the Olivet Discount. But what he says is this. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Uh, 
Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse is being directed, or Jesus' words, as written about in Luke's account, are directed more to the first century. Because the siege of Jerusalem was that sign that the disciples, the believers in Jesus, who were taking note of his words, would flee to the mountains. The Titus campaign that uh, was effectively around the year AD 70, actually we know from the ancient writings, including those of Josephus, that it was never Titus, presumably Vespasian, who was now the emperor, desire to destroy the temple. They wanted to convert the temple for pagan usage. However, it was set on fire, rightly or wrongly, and was destroyed as such in the Titus campaign. The, the very fact is that we believe that something like 1.1 million Jewish people died during this uh, first century catastrophe or cataclysm, shall we say. I'm putting up this verse because it's a little bit controversial and I like being controversial as you know. Jesus applies these words in Zechariah 13 to himself in the Gospels. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This is God speaking. It's very hard words. And I will turn my hand against the little ones in the whole land, declares the Lord. Two thirds will be struck down and perish yet one third will be left in it. And this is what happened in the year AD 70. Yes, many were taken, as we will see, into captivity, but nevertheless there was still a Jewish population in the city of Jerusalem after AD 70, and we'll understand that a bit more in a moment. I want to do this, folks. I hope you can cope. The next time we know that 1.1 million people died was in the Holocaust. I believe that these two events delineate what we know as the Great Diaspora. It began with the death of 1.1 million and it ends. It ends with the death of 1.1 million in Auschwitz. Of course, many were taken into captivity, and this is a very famous uh, frieze that is taken from the Titus Arch in Rome. And you see the uh, menorah being taken from uh, the temple back to Rome as, and displayed on the Titus Arch. The temple was in ruins for 60 years. It wasn't demolished in the year AD 70. We know that. It was in ruins for 60 years. Takes us into the second century. And we have within the Talmud a particular tractate, and you can see this at the bottom of the page, which describes an event where several rabbis go and visit to tear their robes and weep in, in and around the city of Jerusalem. On another occasion, they, and this is who they are, Rabbi Gamaliel, or Gamliel, more in Hebrew, I don't know whether that's the... No, it won't be the Paul's family here. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, Rabbi Yehoshua, and Rabbi Akiva, Akiva were ascending to Jerusalem after the destruction of the temple. We're in the second century now, folks. This is what it says in the Talmud. When they arrived at the Temple Mount... They saw a fox that emerged from the sight of the Holy of Holies. They began weeping, and Rabbi Akiva was laughing. The laughter of Rabbi Akiva, or Akiva, 
It's very famous in Jewish history. Why was he laughing? Well, he had hope in that the temple was destroyed by fire, but it wasn't demolished. The structure of the building was still there. But the fact is this. Rabbi Akiva knew his Bible. That's why he could laugh. And now I put this in this morning, actually. This is what it says in the Talmud, was one of the prophecies that he referred to. It was in Micah, chapter 3, verse 12. This is what it says. This is the Lord speaking to his people. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be ploughed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. This was Rabbi Akiva, his experience. This is what he was seeing. He realised that this is written in the Bible. But as I was thinking about it this morning, it's interesting to note the next verse in Scripture. Actually, that's why I like using this scroll is that this is way before the Masoretic text was ever compiled and there is no chapters or verse uh, separation in the text it's all one text the next verse is Micah chapter 4 verse 1 the next verse and this is what it says in the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and peoples will stream into it. Rabbi Akiva knew his Bible. That's why in the midst of devastation he could still laugh. However, this is what I was thinking about this morning. How long is it going to take? between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. Rabbi Akiva didn't know that, but there's a gap here, folks. And it just occurred to me this morning that it was important just to refer to this verse in Hosea chapter 6. After two days, he will revive us. This gives me such hope for the future. And the day of the Lord is 2,000 years. That's what the Bible says. And the temple was destroyed around the year AD 70. We've still got some decades to go before this prophecy will be fulfilled, in my opinion. You don't have to believe me. <laughs> Time will tell. Actually, he was thinking of another prophecy as well and it's recorded in the Talmud and this is the one that he referred to I love this verse I love it actually Zechariah chapter 8 is a fantastic chapter once again men and women you know, we were talking about this last week weren't we folks look at our hair we're all grey all of us I think I'm thinking I'm looking at all of us that we can see once again men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with a cane in hand. Because of his age, the city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. And this is what the Talmud says. This is the verse that uh, Rabbi Akiva was thinking about, which made him laugh. He had hope for the future. However, Rabbi Akiva was not going to live to see its fulfilment. He didn't know that, of course, at the time. So who was he? We need to know a little bit about him. Not too many sermons are preached about Rabbi Akiva. Uh, but we need to know much more about him and everything that he was involved with. Well, this was his full name, Akiva ben Yosef. Remember, I met my Hasidic friend yesterday whose name is Yosef. I don't know what he calls his son, I'm sure. Uh, 
um, born around 50. He died a very significant year in the year 135. Very significant year, as we will see. He was obviously a, a leading Jewish scholar and sage, particularly after the destruction of the temple, where Judaism had to be restructured and rewritten because there was no temple any longer for sacrifice. And he was a major contributor to the Mishnah, which ultimately was going to become the Talmud. But the fact is this, and that's probably one of the reasons why he laughed, is that he was filled at this moment in time, in the second century, with messianic anticipation that the temple would be rebuilt, or the city would be rebuilt, and the temple would be rebuilt. 70 years, obviously leading up to 70 years following its destruction. What gave him hope? He knew his Bible. And he wanted to apply these words to their current situation in, in the second century. The whole country will become desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And in the days of the New Testament... Babylon was Rome. That's a fact. And of course, unfortunately, Rabbi Akiva was a false prophet. You have some sympathy for him. He was desperate, filled with longing. But we know that he was a false prophet because he pointed to somebody else to be Messiah, whose name was Shimon, became known as Bar Kochba, which is son of the star. A star shall come out, out of Jacob. That's why it was called Bar Kochba. Takes us back to the Olivet Discourse, because Jesus said this to his disciples, particularly those that could read, those in the second century in particular, at that time, at that time, if anyone, including Rabbi Akiva, says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. The Bar Kokhba revolt, which was the final Jewish-Roman war, definitely the second, in some cases possibly the third, there's another smaller war in between. The first war, of course, led up to AD 70, began around the Bar Kokhba revolt, began, began around 132 AD. I can't overemphasize this enough, actually, in my opinion. Hadrian and Antiochus Epiphanes are the archetypes of the Antichrist. You can't deny it. In fact, I showed the coins in the last talk. Antiochus Epiphanes in the 2nd century BC made himself, proclaimed himself to be God. That's why he was called Epiphanes. They changed his name to Epimenes, the madman. Denied Jewish people the right to circumcise, to read the scrolls of the Torah, to forbid Judaism. He worshipped Zeus, put his statue in the temple area. And then you come to Adrian in the 2nd century AD, proclaiming himself to be God, refusing circumcision, banning Torah, doing even more than that, as we will see, and worshipped the Roman equivalent to Zeus, Jupiter. I believe, actually, that what we are seeing in the relationship between Hadrian and the Jewish people at this time, a repeat of Daniel's last week of seven years. Now, whatever you think about the future, if you don't take into account that the initial fulfilment of Daniel's 
prophecy in chapter 9 was fulfilled in the 2nd century BC and the final seven years involved the uprising of the Maccabees, the re-establishment of temple worship and the establishment of Hanukkah. If you don't even think about those things, then you're missing such a lot. But we were seeing a repeat of those seven years, I believe, in the days of Hadrian. And this, of course, is that passage. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, and in the middle of the seven he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of the temple, in brackets, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. And I highlight this, because this is exactly the experience of... um, Antiochus Epiphanes, and it's exactly the experience of the Emperor Hadrian. It's a complete rerun of this prophecy, which is, according to Jesus, appropriate because he says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand this, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I think this for a particular reason. The suggestion in in the Talmud and other ancient writings is that Hadrian initially favoured because he wanted he was a peacemaker. I could talk about Jack Hibbs at this point. Hadrian was a peacemaker. He wanted to make peace throughout his entire empire. And he initially favoured the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And he visited Jerusalem around the year 130 AD. Maybe he even met Rabbi Akiva and gave him optimism that the temple would be rebuilt. Unfortunately, he reneged. He reneged on those suggestions. Perhaps they were never in his mind. He was just trying to appease the populace. And, of course, the city ultimately is destroyed and a new city is built in its place. And here's a nice diagram of (coughs) the city that he was going to build in its place, Elia Capitolina. I'm going to, again, use the same colours to highlight the Temple Mount, which I believe was greatly extended by, um, by Hadrian. Here you see, that, just for information, the position of the Western Wall towards the south of the Temple Mount, which of course is interesting when we think of Tuvia Sagiv. Here I overlay on the Temple Mount uh, a picture of the Temple of Jupiter. That wasn't the only temple that he built, folks. (laughs) Uh, Here you see within uh, Ilia Capitolina another temple, the Temple of Venus. This is really significant so significant because the Temple of Venus, which would have been demolished in the years of Constantine, what did it become? The Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And that, I think, is quite significant. That's another subject for another time. This is a famous map that I overlay uh, in the city of Aelia Capitolina because it's uh, um, part of a mosaic that was discovered in a church, in the Church of St. George. Knowing Jeremy, maybe he's been here, I don't know if he has, in Madaba, in Jordan. I've been to Madaba, but I've not been to the church. Oh, wow. Well, it's a 6th century church, a Byzantine church, and in the floor you get a mosaic, and what they've done, they've lifted this part, which is a map of Ilia Capitolina, which you now see on display in the old city of Jerusalem, and here is what is known as the Cardo, and in the distance you see a fantastic picture of what it looked like. This is what Hadrian built And, of course, many of the remains that you see in Jerusalem today go back, not to the days of Jesus, but to the days of Ilia Capitolina. Think about the Bar Kokhba revolt. As we have come to understand, it was led by Shimon Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba was the name given by Akiva. His name was Kosiva, I think, or Kosiba. (laughs) 
originally. It was changed to Bar Kokhba because he wanted to be known as the son of the star. And he was proclaimed by, by uh, Messiah by Akiva. But of course, this led to the final schism to a certain extent between uh, Jewish people who supported the idea that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah and those followers of Jesus who I've called here messianics. I mean, they were all somewhat messianic one would say, but I'm using the term here to distinguish those people who had already uh, come to understand and to know Jesus as Messiah for themselves. But this was the schism. It was a very violent time. Bar Kokhba demanded that people who joined his army would actually cut off one of their fingers as a sign of their commitment and of course the messianics who refused to do that, many of them were killed by Bar Kokhba himself. The Bar Kokhba revolt began in the city or the town really of Modi'in. Modi'in is south of Jerusalem, not very far from Jerusalem. We have friends who have lived in Modi'in. That's incredible because that's exactly where the Maccabean revolt took place in the second century BC. The Bar Kokhba revolt was a rerun of what took place in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes. Absolutely. And that included where it began in the, in the town of Modi'in. And it was initially successful. I mean, the Maccabees were successful, we know that. And here you see a coin that was minted in the days maybe 132, 133 which were Bar Kokhba's coins and they established an independent uh, Israel for a very brief period of time. But unlike the Maccabees, and you can't overstate this, unlike the Maccabees the revolt ended in total disaster. Total disaster. More so actually than in the first century. This is what Cassius Dio writes, and this one could add to this number. 580,000 Jews were killed in the overall operations, and 50 fortified towns and 985 villages were razed to the ground, with many more Jews dying of famine and disease, and again many were taken into captivity. Um, in 135, the conclusion to the Bar Kokhba revolt was the Battle of Beta, which again wouldn't be that far away even from Modi'in in the year 135. Now that's why that's such a significant year. It was Bar Kokhba's last stand. The amazing thing, according to the rabbis, we don't know this for absolute certainty but again like the first temple Solomon's temple was destroyed in, on Tishba Av the ninth of the month of Av and then the second temple AD 70 Tishba Av but actually the battle of Beitar was completed according to the rabbis on Tishba Av which is a very interesting point and it ushered in something like three years of great tribulation. And that would have included the siege and the Battle of Beta itself. Remember, Hadrian died in the year 138 AD. And I put these words in. You might disagree with these words, and you've got the freedom to do so. But I believe it. This is what Jesus says. For then, there will be great distress, unequalled from the beginning of the world until now, and never, never to be equalled again. How can that be true, Jeff? There's the Holocaust. Time will prove whether I'm right or wrong. It's okay. I don't think there will ever be suffering like took place in the first and the second centuries ever, 
ever again within the land of Israel. There's global events still to take place. But the Lord is watching over this nation to protect it and to keep it safe. I believe it with all my heart. I believe it. The fact is, we really need to know more about Hadrian. The problem is, we don't have Josephus to help us. (laughs) There's not so much. There's some, but there's not so much. The fact is, this is why I talk about Great Tribulation, triggered by these events. All the bodies at Beta were left to rot. They weren't given a burial. This was Hadrian's edict. Actually, it was somewhat reversed. After Hadrian died in 138, and the next emperor, who was Antoninus Pius, allowed for those bodies which had been lying there for years in Beta to be buried. 135. Rabbi Akiva was flayed alive. The leadership, the Jewish leadership, were tortured to death. Hadrian went berserk to wipe the memory of the Jewish people from the land of Israel. One of the ways in which he did it was to forbid Jewish people to enter into Jerusalem, which of course had become Elia Capitolina, except on one day. What day do you think it was? Tish B'Av, which was to rub salt into the wound of their defeat. And this is another thing. He was going to wipe Israel off the map. And one of the ways he was going to do it was to rename the whole province. This isn't just Judea. This is Samaria. This is Galilee, which today is the modern uh, nation of Israel. And he gave it a new name. Syria, Palestina. After the great enemies of the Israelite peoples, the Philistines. Jesus never walked in Palestine, folks. He never did. It was only named Palestina after Hadrian. Now, this is an interesting thing. This is why we really need to know more about Hadrian. Because the epithet that is given to Hadrian in the Talmud, for example, is may his bones be crushed whenever he is mentioned in the text. Never said of Titus or Vespasian in the first century, but is reserved for Hadrian. But I want to put this in. This is a fantastic verse. This is after Rachel has been weeping for her children. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes with tears, for your work will be rewarded. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. You know, it's been an interesting week. We celebrated Israel's 73rd, three years older than Jeremy, 73rd birthday. Actually, it's younger than me, unfortunately. (laughs) I'm moving towards my 74th birthday. Independence Day here, of course, a very famous um, picture of David um, Ben-Gurion talking about the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Very famous photograph. I wanted to show you this one. I love this photograph. It was in the Jerusalem Post this week. Look at this photo. What can you tell me about this photo? There's not one mask. (laughs) Not one mask. And I just wanted to overlay this. This is what Rabbi Akiva was longing for. 
And we're living in those days, folks. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with cane in hand because of his age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. I think of this little boy, Dov, who I got to meet yesterday briefly, who asked me to help him get his Bible. The future is bright. This is another picture from the um, Jerusalem Post. The celebrations in Jerusalem for Independence Day this year. Again, nobody's wearing face masks. I ain't going to say something, folks. You might disagree with me, but you don't need to worry because time will prove one way or the other. The pandemic is over in Israel. From tomorrow, we don't have to wear masks. We can do anything we like. Now, you might say, oh, Jeff, just wait, just wait, just wait. I'm prepared to wait, just wait, just wait. But I believe that the pandemic is over. Israel is watched over by the Lord. He never slumbers nor sleeps. The future is very bright for Israel. And of course, we have these words which are taken from the Olivet Discourse. We're looking at the city of Jerusalem. Actually, this is Mount Herzl. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which is taken from the Olivet Discourse. Of course, it's taken uh, from Luke, uh, Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse. And here within the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is speaking warnings of approaching cataclysm. And that's why I felt it was an appropriate talk to give within this series. In Luke, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Or in Matthew and Mark's account, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I believe this, folks. The first was fulfilled in the first century. The second was fulfilled in the second century. And what Jesus says is, see... I have told you ahead of time. And I ask a question. Why? Why? Is it important that the, the early disciples and the second century disciples of Jesus take note of Jesus' words and flee to the mountains? Why? For this reason. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jew and Gentile, to be continued.